respected and renowned pain management specialist, Dr. Forrest Tennant, will take the driver's seat and in his presentation, provide us with positive options to move beyond the pain. Dr. Forrest Tennant. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here uh, for many reasons. Uh, first and foremost, I have a couple of patients or former patients who continue to make sure that I do things correct. <laughs> right? And Heather. Uh, the second reason I'm glad to be here is I sometimes feel I neglect my backyard. Uh, I travel a week somewhere every week. I'm the editor of the nation's biggest pain journal for physicians and I work for a publisher in New Jersey. My real field of research is trying to adapt laboratory technology to the clinical patient, and I actually work for labs all the way from, I was in Austin, Texas yesterday, and North Carolina, Indiana, and uh, other places, and yet uh, sometimes I feel like I don't do much here in California, and that's sad because you're actually looking at the man who started the first organized pain clinic in the United States, and it was started by accident. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I started off my career as an Army physician during the Vietnam War, and they had a program then to transfer to the Public Health Service, so I was in uh, Heidelberg, Germany one day and barely got my boots off and was a public health fellow at UCLA, where I remained for many years, and started doing pain work here in Los Angeles in 1974. So I didn't know that we were going to do anything special, and I didn't really realize that California has actually been the leader in pain treatment since World War II. And we've actually had laws and things on the books going way back before my time. Now initially when I started, it was in the San Gabriel Valley where I actually sort of ran the county health department on a contract basis, and in those years, the only physicians who prescribed, as what we called them narcotics back then, we call them opioids today, were doctors who had a public health degree. And so, back clear back then, I, if they had somebody who had severe pain, uh, and they needed morphine or Dilaudid or Demerol, I was the person they called on. And I remember that back in those days, uh, the sheriff or the, the DEA or somebody would bring me a patient in their car. I remember them bringing a couple of patients to me and they were 80 years old and in their nightgown, and they said, Doc, we don't think these are really street addicts or heroin addicts, but they're taking a lot of narcotics. <laughs> Who are they? Uh, and it was kind of cute at the time, and it was uh, very friendly and, uh, and very supportive. And the other thing back in those years, City of Hope didn't have pain specialists, and we didn't have good cancer treatments, so I did their pain work clear back in the 70s. Bottom line is, we grew up in this state with the Intractable Pain Act and then the Pain Patient Bill of Rights, and I've sort of been part of that all along. Never in my wildest dream would I have believed that the issue of pain itself would be so big. Never realized what I would be doing. I never realized how short we were going to be on personnel. Never dawned on me we would need self-help groups like you are forming and probably what I can see is the best in the country. In other words, it's a real movement, and uh, so I salute you for being here, and I want to bring to you some of the things I have been working on. Now, Heather told me to come here and tell you things about self-help and what you can do to better yourself, and Heather always gives me these requirements, you see. <laughs> and then I get this message from Mr. Garrett, and he says you're doing CMEs. And if you need CMEs today, of course, you've got to have a PowerPoint, and you've got to have objectives, you've got to have disclosures. And I'm on my way somewhere this week, so I tell my secretary, send him my last presentation. Uh, in fact, I did one last week at our big pain conference, which you may not even know about, in Las Vegas. And it's mainly for medical personnel. But once a year in Las Vegas, we have something called Pain Week. Anybody ever heard of it? It's the biggest thing now going. Five years ago, we had 300 people come. This year, 2,000, and they keep coming. Now, at Pain Week, I give three of the courses. I give the course on what they call pharmacogenetics. That's the genetic testing now to determine what you need or don't need for pain. I do the course on central pain, 
and I do the, the course on hormones and pain. Now, what I'm going to show you today is a little bit of the presentation that I gave last week for the medical personnel nationwide and the presentations that I want to talk to you about, and I am going to get into giving you some of my ideas on what you may do yourself if you're a pain patient or have a loved one or if you're a practitioner. It all kind of comes together, I might add. Now, to get into this, I'm going to tell you what are clearly the two research scientific breakthroughs in pain of the last decade. There are two. The first one is the realization that what we call a peripheral pain may go into the spinal cord and the brain and centralize, meaning it comes out of the work of phantom limb pain. A lot of what I'm about to tell you has been accentuated because of the war in the Middle East and the money and the time and even the recruitment of, of myself. I'm a former Army medical officer. I give the VA and the military two or three days a month to travel and teach. And before you can even talk about how you go about helping yourselves, you must understand what central pain happens to be. And I'm going to give you the lesson because it's taken us years to figure it out, but it's very simple and it's not for just practitioners. Every single pain patient has to thoroughly understand what central pain is. And when you, 10 minutes from now, you're going to know as much as me, but it is critical. Now, the second big research thing is the one I guess I'm the father of. And that is hormones and pain. Today, hormones are being used to replace those that are depleted. But the second big one is the use of hormones for what we now call neurogenesis, meaning the ability to regrow nerves. When I was in medical school, we said you couldn't regrow the heart. You couldn't regrow the liver. You couldn't regrow the kidney. And you certainly couldn't regrow the brain. We now know that's not quite true. We've always used in this state the term intractable pain. It's still on my stationery and on my door. And we used to say that intractable pain was permanent. It was incurable. We've now got to rethink that. That's because we're starting to see people who are regrowing brain tissue. And that's why I'm gone all the time. It's a big thing, wonderful thing, and I'm uh, part of it. With that, I'm going to show you a little bit now about what central pain happens to be. And so when you hear that term, you won't be thrown. Let's, let's throw the PowerPoint up there. Now, here is the official definition of central pain. Now, that is a pain that is driven by a focus inside the brain and characterized by constancy and hyperarousal of the autonomic nervous and endocrine system. Now, what does that really mean? In simple terms, what that means is that the pain itself is lodged inside the brain and can't get out. It hyperarouser overstimulates the whole nervous system. And autonomic just means the involuntary automatic nervous system. This is why your blood pressure goes up, your pulse rate goes up, your eyes dilate, you sweat all the time, you can't sleep, and half the time you're sick at your stomach, and you can't think, you can't function. You get the picture? Sounds like some of you know all about that, <laughs> okay? But that's what that means. Now, how do you get this? You can get it three ways. The number one way, and the old traditional way, was that you had a brain injury, usually a stroke, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. But the big cause today of brain inflicted, direct brain inflicted central pain is what? Traumatic brain injury, traumatic brain injury. And the understanding of this is truly amazing. A lot of it has been fostered by all the injuries coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and guys like me spending our time focusing on this. An awful lot of people who have been referred to my clinic with the diagnosis of fibromyalgia or neuropathies or arthropathies or autoimmune disease really started with head trauma. And so today, and you need to ask yourselves, did you have an accident in a car? Were you, did you pass out? Did you fall down the steps? Did you play football too many years? Did you box? And if you had some of those concussions, or you got hit an awful lot of times, and here it is 10 years later, and you've got fibromyalgia or neuropathy, it probably started with your head trauma. 
And we've now the mechanism of how this works is quite clear. Second way you get this, we do believe there are a set of diseases that just sort of light in the brain. We call it de novo, meaning arising with no apparent cause. We don't, we think there's always a cause, but the classic one there is fibromyalgia. Uh, throwing right in with that is interstitial cystitis, uh, vulvodynia, prostodynia, uh, an irritable bowel. Uh, and so we have that set of cases. We actually think today that most of the fibromyalgia cases have to do with occult or undiagnosed until you do a new kind of MRI neck trauma or neck disease or a lot of infections. Uh, a lot of the severe cases, for example, of fibromyalgia I see are the auto, uh, are autoimmune diseases usually started with infectious mononucleosis or another virus. Uh, one of the things that I would highly recommend you guys do is the fibromyalgia organizations out of Portland is a wonderful organization and they've been the one that's fostered the research that would be a good one to affiliate with. Now the other one and the one that brings me here is the top one. Let's go back. And that is this. You can walk out of this door, fall down on the steps, you can get hit today, you can catch a disease, you can have diabetic neuropathy, arteriosclerotic neuropathies, and if you can't get that injury after your surgery or your injury gone, famous, finished within about six weeks, that means the pain is centralized. And that's a term that means the pain is gone from what we call the periphery into the spinal cord and brain and lodged there. That's the term centralization, meaning in standard anatomical lingo, the periphery were always the nerves outside the spinal cord and the brain, and the central was the brain itself and the spinal cord itself. The theory on this comes out of working with phantom limb pain because, you know, the guy or the gal had her hand or foot shot off and it still has pain. Well, it turns off, it's the same mechanism, it's just that some of you got to keep your limbs, okay? But it's the same mechanism on how it works. And I'm going to show you a little bit how that's all been worked out. Okay, let's take the next slide. Now, central pain is really, like any disease, mild, moderate, or severe. Next slide. And you can have both pain lodged in the brain, and you can still have an inflammatory site in your spine, like arachnoiditis, or in your knee where you've got inflammatory arthritis. So you can have it be central, peripheral, or a combination of both. And one of the things we're trying to teach doctors and nurse practitioners is that forget those old terms like nociception and some of these kind of terms, even terms like RSD or archaic, CRPS, archaic. It's really what's important. Do you have a central pain? Do you have peripheral or do you have both? Because the treatments and the approaches are going to be different. So when Heather wanted me to talk about what you do about your pain going forward, well, first off, you've got to sit here and ask yourself the question, do I have central pain or do I not? Okay? So, and you can answer those questions sitting here. Is your pain there all the time? Uh, can you sleep? Uh, is your blood pressure up? Your pulse rate up? You sweat all the time? Are your hands and feet cold? Oh, let me talk about hands and cold feet now. I start my examination of a pain patient when I shake their hand. So if I went around and shook your hands, I was just trying to diagnose you. That was all. <laughs> now, why would your hands and feet get cold? You get something called vasoconstriction, and you've got a lot of little blood vessels in the hands and the feet, so all you've got to do if you examine a pain patient is shake their hands and feel their feet, and if they're cold, you made the diagnosis. It's pretty, pretty simple, okay? That's the way it works. Okay, now let's go on. This, te this is now what we're teaching all the doctors, like last night I was, had a class for doctors in Austin, and it's diagnosed, I want to go back again just real quick. We do not have a specific test for this, okay? But we have a lot of indirect laboratory tests now, and we teach doctors, or if I'm trying to, everybody, including patients how to know whether you have it or not. Now let's take the next slide. Next, okay, and I've already talked about this. This is uh, how you diagnose it. One other thing I did not mention, for example, I bet you somebody's in here who's had a cortisone shot in their back or put on a lidoderm patch and it didn't work. Well, that's because you no longer have peripheral pain. The pain went upstairs. See what I'm getting at? So when some of these treatments don't work, and it's been very disappointing. I used to take it personal. I'd teach people physical therapy, acupuncture, give them shots, one thing or another. It didn't work. I thought maybe my technique was wrong. Nope. 
The pain went somewhere else. I was treating a dead area, okay, or a normal area maybe. Let's take the next slide. Now, you get a lot of manifestations of this condition. We now know why everybody's going to be depressed if you have central pain and it's uncontrolled, why you're going to have fatigue, uh, why you're going to be almost functionally paralyzed, you're going to be reclusive, you're going to stay at home bed bound, you're not going to want to talk to anybody because you probably can't think well enough to talk to anybody sometimes, and so you're going to get all of these things until that central pain gets controlled by whatever means. Next slide. And we've already talked about these are the symptoms of the hyperaroused autonomic or automatic nervous system. Let's take the next slide. Now, for example, here's a recent patient of mine. She comes in the clinic, and it's 104 degrees outside, and she's freezing. Pretty good indication she's got central pain, obviously. And, and so that's kind of the way it goes. Next slide. And her hands are kind of spindly, and they're cold as ice. So you make the diagnosis just by some simple things. Next slide. The other thing that happens is that with central pain, the pain activates a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus makes what they call releasing hormones, which activates the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland pumps out something called adrenocorticotropin. That's the hormone that goes to the adrenal gland and raises the cortisol and the pregnenolone and the DHEA, but it also activates the gonads, meaning either over your testicle and you raise your estrogen and progesterone and so in the early phases of central pain, you can now take a central blood test and make the diagnosis fundamentally by knowing if seeing any of the hormones go up. Okay. Now, if you don't control that pain, pretty soon the pituitary and the adrenal glands and the ovary and testicle wear out and the hormones drop. Okay. Now, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on hormones for a second. One of the reasons why I'm standing before you is within the last two years, the technology has come forward to where we can measure these things in range. Now, we've always been able to measure them. We knew they were there, present or absent. But in pain work, we've got to know the high level in the blood and the low level so we can bring it into normal range. Now, if you have a deficiency of any of these, your pain is not going to be controlled. You can go ahead and take all the duragesic patches, all the morphine, oxycontin you want. You're not going to get pain control because these hormones regulate the brain centers and the opioids themselves to give you pain relief. So you got a low pregnenolone or a low DHEA, don't plan on getting much pain relief. And those are sometimes the people who keep coming into the doctor saying, doctor, this isn't working. And the doctor doesn't know enough to take a panel and find out. Now today, you can go right down here to LabCorp or Quest, any of the laboratories, and on a single blood tube, measure all those things. The people I was with last night is working on measuring all these hormones on a finger stick. Okay? That's one of the things we're working on. So this gives you some idea where we're going. Great interest in the country on figuring out how to put some objectivity into this. This idea that we can't measure pain is also a statement that's got to go out the window. Yeah. In the past, all we could do is say, Nellie, is your pain 1 to 10? Not today. Nellie, we don't care about your pain score. What's your hormone levels? How cold are your hands? How's your reflexes? And we can do the genetic markers. And I was just talking to Mindy about this. We just finished a test. In fact, I won an award last week on my looking for inflammatory markers in the brain. And so we can now measure a lot of those cytokines and things in the brain that we couldn't used to. Okay. Now let me move on here for a minute. But here is the thing that you do need to know. This centralization can occur immediately. Now, we see this on the battlefield. You'll see it in injuries. You can see it in sports. And that is some people, within two minutes after their injury, can centralize the pain, and it's stuck. We're not quite sure how it happens that fast, but it can happen that fast. Other people, and the, the classic one is post-surgery. Somebody gets a hernia orophy, a hysterectomy, tonsillectomy. Pain's not gone in six weeks, you can bet that is centralized. So there's a real movement among astute physicians who do surgeries and, and anesthesiology to try to get rid of that pain within six weeks because we know what that means. Okay, we know what that means. And that's why also sometimes you go out and get the surgery and you get worse rather than better. Okay, anybody had that happen? Yeah, it does happen. And lastly, 
And this is the one I hate to see because we could have prevented this one. The patient who goes on for a long time. Oh, they got a little pain in their knee or their back or their head. Oh, every day or a few hours a day. And it goes on like that and it's controlled with a little Celebrex or Motrin or exercise or acupuncture or what have you. But then all of a sudden one day they wake up and they've got it. It's sort of they caught it. And I find it a tragic thing when I see this or I hear this because the patients are quite desperate. They'll come to me and they'll say, you know, Doc, I was doing real well. But last Thursday I woke up and it was like it took me over or it grabbed me, it caught me. And maybe you've been in that place too. And so you don't even want to take the patient who says they've just got intermittent arthritis or neuropathies. Uh, we've just been cavalier about this. And in retrospect, uh, there's not a doctor in the world who hasn't can't say the same thing, because we just didn't know, just didn't know how serious it could be. Anyway, that gives you some idea. Got a couple, three other fascinating slides to show you. Let's take the next one. How does this happen? How does this happen? Well, first off, when you get an injury, you get what's called a peripheral pain site. And inside that pain site, it's really a biologic cesspool. You're going to damage the nerve, but if you damage the nerve, axiomatically, you're also going to damage its blood vessels and its lymph drainage, and so you're going to have a pocket of biologic waste because the lymph collects in there, the cytokines, the inflammatory markers, the electricity accumulates, and that's why it's hot, it's red, it's warm. Now, that's an inflamed pain site. But we believe it's these inflammatory markers or electric charges that go up the nerve somehow into the spinal cord or into the brain and it activates an animal, something in the spinal cord in the brain called a glial cell. How many of you have heard of a glial cell? Good. Well, the rest of you will be experts in about two minutes, okay? It took 30 years to figure all this out and I can teach it to you in three minutes, okay? No problem. <laughs> okay. okay, let's take the next slide. But so as you get the injured nerves, it doesn't make any difference whether it's your plantar fasciitis, whether it's your headache on the skull, whether it's your ear or your carpal tunnel, it doesn't make any difference. That's a peripheral nerve injury. It goes retrograde into the spinal cord and the brain, and it activates something called a microglial cell. Now, glial cells have been thought since 1860. There was a Dr. Verkal, uh, a German fellow, who said that those are just supportive cells. They're just sponge. It's really the neurons that conduct everything in the central nervous system. What nobody ever realized until just very recent years, and incidentally, the people who have been working on RSD have been the really ones who have really figured this out. These glial cells are like white blood cells, and they look like them almost. And when these inflammatory markers or excess electric charges come into the spinal cord, the glial cells pull in their tentacles, and they start moving around just like a white blood cell in the serum. And they go hunting around trying to mop up the infending agent to heal us. It causes, we call it now, neuroinflammation. Remember that term. We've always had inflammation. Now we'd like to say we have neuroinflammation because it's inside the nervous system. Now, once this neuroinflammation gets going, it's just like neuroinflammation in the knee or the shoulder or the elbow. A little inflammation is good because you get cured. A lot of inflammation is called tissue destruction. Tissue destruction. And so next slide. With this destruction, the brain cells are broken down and they leak out their toxins, glutamate and other neurotoxins, and it starts killing cells around it. In other words, it's a tissue destructive process. Well, that is my message today. That's why I'm here. And I speak to anybody who wants to listen these days. Because when that neuroinflammation gets going, it starts destroying brain tissue. You want to have a bad day? Look at all the brain scan studies on central pain. It's depressing. Gray and white matter start to disappear. I now have patients who are 40 years old, and we didn't know what was the matter with them. They're now demented. They've now got to have domiciliary and custodial care. We've even now got a new classification for dementia and for domiciliary care. Severe pain patients, and nobody knew what was happening, but the neuroinflammation ruined their brain. 
They can no longer teach or be a police officer. I've got four doctors in my practice. None of them can practice. They're impaired, mentally. Nobody knew what was happening to them. And they were doctors. So it happens to any of us. And it happens so suddenly that the patient may not know about it. That's why having the family involved, having groups involved, the ministers involved, the social workers, anybody who can get your hands on, preach and teach this. Because this is a serious thing if it's not diagnosed and you don't try to control it. That's where the hormones come in. Okay. Now, and then as the brain tries to reform itself, it's got a fancy name called neuroplasticity or reorganization. The whole process is sometimes called central sensitization. You don't have to know any of that stuff. They're just wastebasket term for people who really don't want to tell you what they don't know at any rate. As the brain tries to heal itself, somehow the memory of the pain gets lodged there. We don't quite understand how, we just know what happens. And we don't have a cure for it at this time, but some of the hormone works that I'm going to get into, yeah, we're getting some good things. And some of the simple things we've always believed in, nutrition, exercise, uh, certain socialization things, mental things, are critical. Because all the medicine and hormones in the world aren't going to do anybody much good if they don't work with you on trying to get more oxygen into the brain and a few nutrients in there, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Okay. Now... If you will look on your left-hand side, you will see a slide from a rat brain. Now, this rat brain has been uh, terminally injured, and, and so his brain was taken out. And on the left-hand side, the orange is the neuron, and the green are the glial cells, and they are normal. You'll notice they've got kind of tentacles, and they're not very big. On the right-hand side is the same rat brain after the neuroinflammation has started. So those glial cells have about quadrupled in size. They're migratory. They pulled in their tentacles. They're running around destroying anything they can get its hands on. So that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Next slide. But the key thing I want everybody to know is that this is progressive. This is progressive, and, and it's got to be stopped. So how, how do we stop it? How do, how do we deal with this? Well, I'm going to tell you some of the things I'm doing and I'm recommending. Do I guarantee them? No. I just tell you, uh, uh, Wendy and I were driving up and telling me about an over-the-counter inflammatory product. I'm all ears. Any, <laughs> any ideas anybody's got, you don't hold back. In other words, if you've got something that you think works particularly on inflammation, helps people think, remember, get rid of their depression, let's pass it around because right now I'm going to tell you everything science knows. And we're short, okay? We're short. Uh, now, one of the things that I'm just going to tell you right out front, one of the things of why I'm so happy to be here today is that all of you are interacting. When I know somebody's got central pain, and it's not just the medicines and the nutrients, I want them to start working out that brain. Now, it's very interesting on what the two basic things you do to really try to make a brain keep its power. And I've there's been a lot of things out there. I don't think these will surprise you. One is reading, reading. Second is socialization, meaning start talking, okay? Now, if there's one thing pain, a person in pain hates to do is leave, talk to anybody. They don't want to even talk on the phone. They don't want to go anywhere. And you try to force them to do that. And it's great that you're all interacting with each other because you're feeding the system. You're feeding the system, uh, and you're feeding it because you're oxygenating it. I'm going to talk about oxygen in a couple of minutes. What's oxygen? That's what makes healing occur. You can take all the medicines in the world, all the nutrients, all the exercise, but if you're not getting more oxygen into the diseased area, you're not getting anywhere. So how do you get oxygen in? Well, take a couple of deep breaths. You just got a little extra. Okay. So I'm sitting here seeing a lot of you breathing pretty shallow. How about a few deep ones? You know, you might. Uh, so a little deep breathing, as simple as that. Uh, walking, uh, getting on a trampoline, uh, socializing, uh, you know, uh, driving in L L.A. traffic. You're going to take a few deep breaths. <laughs> okay. So remember, that's the old saying, a little stress is a good thing. Too much is a bad thing. A little stress brings in more oxygen. So oxygen is, you've got to have a lot of oxygen. i got a whole handout on oxygen. Okay, diet. Uh, 
A couple things about diet. You hear a lot of arguments about diet, and I only have two thoughts about diet for, for pain patients now. This is not for weight patients. This is not for cholesterol patients, diabetics, arterial sclerotics, or weightlifters. This is for pain patients. Pain patients need certainly one thing and probably two things. They've got to take in protein. Protein. Why protein is what makes up amino acids. Amino acids are what makes your endorphins and your glutamine and all the things you've got to have to make your hormones and neurotransmitters internally so you can get some relief. So protein. Now what's protein? That's chicken, that's beef, that's fish. I don't care whether they're eating fatty foods or not. If it's protein, go for it. Okay? They want to get fat, be my guest. Just get some protein into you. Now, why do I say that? Pain drives down your natural blood sugar just a little bit. So do opioids. So pain patients hate protein. They just love sugar because their sugar is a little depressed due to both the pain and the opioids. So you th I think I got a carbohydrate problem because I love bread and, you know, the pancakes and the cereals and the bananas like everybody else. But pain patients doubly love them. So you got to sort of let them know you got to force a little protein in too, folks. Now the second thing, which I don't know is a fact, you hear a lot about anti-inflammatory foods. I don't know whether it's a fact, but green vegetables are thought to have enough antioxidants and enough anti-inflammatories in them to be recommended, and I certainly do. Do they help? I don't know, but I don't have anything else to recommend. Okay, but anyway, a little broccoli and a little fish doesn't hurt anybody. Okay. All right, supplements, uh, fish oil. I did a survey of my own patients and some other people's patients a couple of years ago, and kind of interesting. The number one supplement they all took were fish oil. I thought it was kind of strange, but you know, the body's kind of interesting. It kind of tells you what to do. And so fish oil has turned out to be uh, the number one supplement that pain patients on their own have learned to take. And fish oil is clearly anti-inflammatory. The catch is you gotta know how much to take. You need about 4,000 milligrams a day, that's four grams. Now those great big awful greasy things, you know, that you buy in a health food store, they're about a gram. You need about two in the morning, two at night. They're awful, but they probably help, okay? They probably help. B12, people have, in pain have found that B12 helps for years, and we now know why. B12 and folic acid make the lining of nerves work. Uh, let me go on. Uh, Taurine is the amino acid is number one. I don't have time to explain why. Increase in blood flow. Let's see the next slides. Uh, what's interesting, whatever the, either whatever your insurance will pay, your pharmacy, your stock, or your pocketbook will afford, okay? Do something three times a week. <laughs> but don't get a prior authorization. Just see if you can steal it somewhere, you know. B12's getting hard to get. <laughs> we have this great country, you know, we can go to war. We can pay Wall Street a lot of money. We can pay the bureaucrats a lot of money. But we don't have any supplies of B12. I mean, give me a break. I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> us doctors are a little, little hostile these days. <laughs> but, uh, it turns out that empirically, we've done a pretty good job of treating intractable pain and central pain without knowing what we were doing. It was really empirical. So all the things you see on that slide actually work pretty good, and they were really brought about more on how patients responded and told the medical profession and the pharmaceutical profession, you know, you guys, here's what seems to be working for me, so we've kind of went with it. But up till this time, we haven't had tests, we haven't had the technology or the knowledge to go forward. So we use all of those things. But what I want to close out with is the new kid on the block, the hormones, for just a moment. You can turn off the slides here. Years ago, when I was just doing addiction medicine here in Los Angeles, I actually started taking hormone levels on both drug addicts as well as on pain patients. And I could see abnormalities, but I didn't have the tests. Uh, you couldn't even do a cortisone test until 1955. Uh, John F. Kennedy's cortisone problems had to be measured without the benefit of lab tests, for example. At any rate, think of the hormone movement, two, two phases, replacement and treatment. And patients today who have severe pain, I try to get doctors to take a profile right before you start them into treatment. Before somebody can get admitted to my clinic, they've got to get a hormone profile because I'm now totally dependent upon knowing what to do for them. 
So I have them do a profile of about six hormones. If one of those are down, they've got to be replaced at least temporarily. So replacement. If you're taking opioids, and particularly if you're taking a long-acting opioid, fentanyl patch, uh, oxycontin, morphine, cotton, methadone, uh, exalgos, uh, oxymorphone, which is opana, if you're taking any of those long-acting, your hormones need to be checked every three months because if you're taking a long-acting opioid, 80% uh, of you are going to have a suppressed hormone. And if you don't bring that back up, the hormones quits working. I mean, the, the opioid quits working. And plus that, you, you, you're fatigued, you're weak, you're depressed, your libido's gone. There's an awful lot of things that these hormones do and don't do. So that's called replacement. But I want to close this out, since we're at a women's conference, on some of the most exciting things I have, I've ever seen. Now, I'm going to be a little cautious here because I've been disappointed before. And in research, you know, you roll the dice, you hope that it comes out down the line. But I'm going to ask all of the women here, you men can answer the question too if you would like. When you were pregnant, did your pain get better? When you delivered a baby, did you get the job done? Anybody in this room besides me delivered babies professionally? A couple of you? I always wonder how you could do it. Because all I did was sit there and look at all those tears and all the bleeding, and I said, how in the world can you live through this? <laughs> they did. And what I'm about to tell you is, in a way, kind of sad. Because in the basic science literature, meaning those people who hide down in the basement at USC and UCLA and never come up for air except once every six months, their only friends are rats and hamsters, <laughs> have actually done some great work. And they did a lot of it 20 years ago. It's just that us dummies in the clinic, we just didn't pay any attention to it. What am I getting at? I'm going to tell you a little vignette and close it out. It's now been about five years ago that I had a nurse practitioner who worked for me in a clinic that I owned up in Fresno. And she did a lot of weight work, and she called me one day, and she said, Dr. Tennant, I'm giving all these patients HCG. Now, they're not losing any weight, but their fibromyalgia is getting a lot better. <laughs> and she said, what do you think about that? And I said, I think it's a hoax. I don't believe it. So I go up to Fresno. Now, incidentally, if you've ever driven 99 Highway once, you've done it. And anyway, <laughs> it's a long, boring drive to Fresno, as you know. So I go up there, and... I talked to the first three or four people who supposedly were benefiting their fibromyalgia or arthritis due to HCG. I didn't think too much of it, but after about a dozen people, I said, I think there's something here. So I started looking in the literature. I found out that some years ago there was an Italian physician who used HCG on arthritis and neuropathies and got tremendous results. And then I looked up those basic science people, the, the guys chasing the rats. Turned out they had taken rats, cut their spinal cord in half, watched the rat drag around the cage with their back hind end dragging, and gave them HCG and the spinal cord regrow. I said, there's something here. And then I recalled all the pregnant women I had seen whose pain and addiction almost went away when they were pregnant. And why? During pregnancy, your HCG goes off the roof. What's HCG in pregnancy? It goes up along with some other hormones, but it goes up because HCG is the hormone in males and females that grows nerve tissue, skin, hair, and nails. It's called the ectoderm. So six years ago, we started giving it to pain patients. It took a while to work out the dosages. We've now had some people on it six years. And for the first time, I started seeing people who were really taking a lot of opioids, severe intractable pain patients, reducing their dosage, pain down, and it was something to deceive. And then I had another situation recently. I had a mother bring a young boy to me, and I came down from Santa Cruz, and he has something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Anybody know what that is? That's sort of the rubber man syndrome where you can put your arm behind you and what have you. Well, this little young boy, he could turn his whole leg around, and they'd tried every opioid in the book. It didn't work. I ran genetic tests on him. He had all kinds of genetic defects. But now this mother may not be known to you, but it's known to doctors. 
This is one of these mothers with a master's degree, spends all her time on the computer, uh, reads everything, and is kind of pushy and doesn't take no for an answer. You ever meet anybody like that? <laughs> And so she comes down and she tells me she's in the doctor's center. I know you're a renowned man, but we don't really think you know what you're doing. <laughs> I want you to give my boy oxytocin. I says, oxytocin? But he's not breastfeeding. <laughs> he's not delivering a baby. At the time, all I knew about oxytocin was what I remembered from my days of being a general practitioner and delivering a few babies, that your oxytocin went up at the time of delivery and we, I thought it was for uterine contractions. And I thought when you nursed a baby, it was to bring the milk down. Well, it may do those things. But making a long story short, the studies are now pretty clear. And again, those guys down in the basement with the rats have done studies that are embarrassing to read because they're 20 years old. Turns out that we've been laboring, mislaboring under the belief that the endorphins were the major internal pain relievers. It's not, it's oxytocin. Oxytocin is a pure pain reliever, okay? In fact, it looks to me like much more potent than endorphin. It looks like it's sort of a lyric uh, or a gabapentin, but about 10 times more potent. And it does not, and it cuts off brain, pain signals at the brain stem, and it's very potent. Anyway, I told the young, the mother, I said, well, I don't know what the dose is, but I'll make a shot at it. So I did a little studying, gave him an experimental dose. They call up three days later and says, works. He's totally out of pain. And I said, I can't believe that at any rate. Make a long story short, oxytocin goes way up at the time of delivery, not so much for uterine contractions, but to give you enough pain relief, you don't die. It goes up when you breastfeed, I assume, because a lot of those little rascals are really can be brutal to breast, I assume. I also didn't know that men also make HCG and oxytocin for the same reason. And it's made in the pituitary gland. We didn't even know until the last five or six years that men made these things. But we now know that in all of us sitting here, oxytocin and chorionic gonadotropin are in all of us. They're major, major for us in both growing nerves and relieving our pain. So what have I done lately? I said, I've gone this far. I might as well give a few people, both of them together including some men. So I've induced pregnancy in a few men. <laughs> it's early, but I do want to tell you that it's, it's, it's great hope. No, no question about it. You'll hear a lot about hormones and pain. I don't have all the answers yet, but it is early. And to close, I just want to say this. I, again, I hope you get my enthusiasm. I salute you for being here. And incidentally, you know, when you're from L.A., I go traveling around. And, you know, California has a lot of problems. But I even wear a suit and tie when I'm from California. They're shocked. They think I'm in, you know, you know they think I should be wearing Bermuda shorts, and I tell them I have a wife. That gets to them. Anyway, uh, but, any, but I'm only half joking. We've still got the best brains here. We've still in, in medical technology and in the medical fields. And we certainly need a group like you, because a lot of you have got the problem, you're interested in it. Uh, I've got a lot of things you ought to be doing. I've been very involved in this FDA debate over the opioids, and I don't know that you know, they made a final ruling yesterday on long-acting opioids. It's going to affect all pain practices. In my opinion, it was a good ruling. We're not going to lose the opioids. We are going to start putting out under what conditions long-acting opioids can be used, and fundamentally, it's going to turn out which doctors can prescribe them. Okay? So we've got some things coming. You need to be aware of these things. I'll be more than happy to join you. You've been a lot of lovely audience, a lot of fun. I salute what you're doing. I'm proud to be a small part of it.